Dr. Valerie Swan and today we'll be talking about water quality and how to test for it. With water quality we'll look at a few different components. First we'll look at the physical aspects. Physical aspects include temperature, dissolved solids, pH. With the temperature today we won't test that because in our lab everything is a consistent 22 degrees Celsius. But if you were testing it out in the field, you would want to see if it's warmer or if it's colder. Your warmer organisms, they will prefer more of the shallow streams and shallow areas where things tend to heat up from the sun faster. With the colder things and colder organisms, they'll go deeper. Like when you think you're deep sea fishing, you get those big cold fish. With the dissolved solids, that's looking at your conductivity, that's looking at your magnesium, that's looking at your calcium. Those are your electrolytes, they're going to show how well that conducts with electricity. Then we'll look at pH. With pH, we'll look at that with a litmus test. That's a strip that's embedded with a dye. That dye tests for how acidic or how alkaline. With our water, most of it will fall a little more on the alkalinity because we're in Kentucky where we have a lot of limestone that we're well known for and it makes our water a little bit more alkaline. With the pH scale, it's going to range from 1 all the way to 14. Your deionized water or filtered water, that'll test right at 7. That 7 will be right in the middle. With water that's more acidic, if you're in an area that has more acidic water, you're looking more towards that 5. The 5 will have a higher hydrogen concentration. With our water, we're looking more around an 8, maybe a 9 at best. That's more hydroxide in the water, more OH groups for that more alkaline water. Then we'll test our chemical aspect. Our chemical is looking at our dissolved oxygen. That's important for biological organisms because they need oxygen to thrive. We, will look at, we won't look at the hardness of the water, but the hardness is also looking at that calcium and magnesium. You could be looking at other dissolved things in your water as well. Depending on where you live, if you're in the city, you might have different compounds dissolved in there. Or you might have kind of salts or get lime scale in your bathroom if you have hard water. You've seen sort of that scummy stuff film. We'll look at our nitrates in our water and we'll also look at our phosphates. Those are going to be done through a chemical reaction. So will our dissolved oxygen. We'll do some basic titrations with these today. It'll go through a series, we'll talk about the different compounds we're putting in, but we won't go too in depth on the actual chemical reaction happening, because we're just looking for water quality and that it changes the colors it should. Finally, we'll look at biological. With this, this is a test that we've already done. We've already let our samples sit overnight so that we can see how they react. We'll see what's called a coliform bacteria. These mean colony forming. This is different bacteria living in our waters. So before we get started, we'll talk about the three different samples we have today. We have one sample that's coming from a stream locally. This stream has a lot of boulders and rocks where water is washing over it. We'll see at the end it's going to have some of that color form. It'll have some different sediments to it and it'll be rich in some different minerals. Our second water is going to be our filtered water. That's more of your drinking water. If you get maybe a Brita filter at home or you drink bottled water, these are things that are filtered. They don't have all that sediment. They have much more neutral pH. And we'll also look at a stagnant pond water. Our pond water is coming from the University of Kentucky's Gluck Pond. That's somewhere that's aerated, so it gets a lot of oxygen. We'll see at the end the gas forming components. And it's also visited by a lot of our local geese. Once we get into the experiments today or during our lecture, YouTube does have a feature to turn on the captions. Some of these words might mistranslate a little bit. If you had any questions or concerns or difficulty understanding something, feel free to send me an email. My email will be at the end of this program. First, we're going to test the pH of our waters. We have three different samples here. Our first sample, this is Veterans Park in Lexington, Kentucky. This is a stream with a lot of boulders and different things flowing through it. 
Our next sample of water here is deionized water. This is like your filtered drinking water that you might get from a Brita water filter or maybe even bottled water. And our third sample here comes from the University of Kentucky Glock Pond. This is pond water where it has a good amount of aeration to it, but it's still frequented by local geese and has a lot of things growing in it. To test the pH, we will take three strips of our pH paper, one for each water. We will open each water and we'll put this in here. We'll count to five. One, two, three, four, Five. Set it aside. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Now this paper is embedded with a dye. The dye changes color in accordance to how basic or acidic it is. Here in Kentucky, we have a lot of natural limestone. That's what's characteristic of our region. So we expect to see things more in this blue-green range. This means that it has more OH or hydroxide, it's more alkaline, it's more basic. If you live in an area that has more acidic water, then you'd expect to see more along this red-orange kind of range. Ideally, water should be around a seven. So we can see with our deionized or our filtered water, it matches around that six right there. It's kind of in between that six and seven. We're just picking the color that matches the best. And that's about what we'd expect. Then with our stream water, we take this along the side and it's, it's right between an eight and a nine. That's what we would expect for natural Kentucky water. And then we'll take our pond water. Our pond water, we can see, is actually a little over a nine there. So that pond water has quite a bit. Now that we've tested the pH of our waters, we are going to test the conductivity. With the conductivity, this is looking for electrolytes. Typically our electrolytes are magnesium and calcium. We're going to use this traceable meter right here. So again, in Kentucky, we would expect to see quite a bit of conductivity because we have a lot of electrolytes in our water. We have very mineral rich water in this region of the country. Before we start, we're gonna wash off our meter. This is just kind of clearing it out, making sure that there's nothing on it. We'll take our meter and hit set. So we're seeing 391. This is very conductive water. This is what came out of our stream. This is what we'd expect because all that water is going over boulders. It's picking up those minerals. It's picking up those electrolytes. It's actually going up as we leave it in there a little bit longer. So this conducts very well with electricity. You can see if I shake it a little, that shaking, that pushes that electrical current even more. Now we'll remove this, conduct this conductor from the water. And I'll just put this cap back on. Now we will see how this conducts in our filtered water or in our bottled water or our, our Brita kind of water. This is water that's been typically stripped of a lot of minerals because you don't want to drink too many minerals. Drinking excessive amounts of minerals can cause health issues like kidney stones. So if you're, if you're in a southern state, you might know quite a few people that have had problems like that and it's because your water is very mineral rich. So now we'll look at more of what our city drinking water is. When we look at the conductivity, we've got Almost 12 units so far, we can watch it here. We can watch that it's going up much slower than our stream water was, and it's substantially lower. With our drinking water and our filtered water, they do add some of those electrolytes back in after they take it out, but there's just not as much in there. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. So we have 12 in contrast to the water out of our stream that was flowing over a boulder. 
that had 400. And if we shake it a little, we can see it actually does not become more conductive when we shake it because it just doesn't have a high mineral content. Now we'll take this out and we're gonna rinse this once again and then we're gonna compare it with our pond water. Now we can have a couple different hypotheses with this pond water. One could say, well, the pond water is probably more conductive because it's, it's also going to be that Kentucky water that's very mineral rich and it's sitting in a bed of limestone where another hypothesis could be it's more conductive than our bottled water, but less conductive than the stream. And that's because the stream was going directly over boulders, directly over giant minerals. So let's see what we get. Okay, we're at 268 and it's holding pretty steady with this pond water. So we'd go with that second hypothesis where the pond water, it is that, that local Kentucky mineral rich water. So it is much more conductive than our bottled water but it's sitting in a stagnant pond where the stream was going over those boulders, over those rocks. It was getting enriched more and more and more with mineral, with magnesium, with calcium. So our stream was the most conductive. Our bottled water was the least conductive and our pond water hit kind of somewhere in the middle. And we'll take this out. We'll just clean up our setup station here. Okay, so now we'll look at the organisms in our water. With this water, we put a special chemical in here that turned it a violet color. So we have this violet color here in the middle. With this chemical, it sits overnight. These all were able to sit throughout the whole night. And the next day, if there is bacteria or organisms growing, that violet color will turn clear. And we can even see some of the organisms growing in the bottom here. So we had our three different waters again. We had our first water here. This was our stream water. We can see those bacteria growing in it. It turned clear because it does have what's called coliform bacteria. These are things like E. coli. These are colony forming bacteria. So when you see coliform, you see part of the word colony in there, colony forming. This is something that you would have done to your water if maybe you bought a property and you were thinking about using the well on it. You would want to see if there was coliform bacteria. When I shake it, I have this little glass rod in here that stirs it. You can really see all those bacteria showing up. So this is not water you would want to drink. Our second water here, this was our bottled or our filtered water. There's nothing growing in here. I can shake it, there's, there's nothing happening. So this is awesome water to drink. It's nice and clean. It stayed purple. And then bottle number three was from the pond. With the pond, there's a really unique feature here. At the top, we can see a little bit of a gas bubble. The pond had an aerator on it. This is kind of a decorative pond at the university, so it does have things growing in it, but it also has extra gas growing and gas coming up at the top too, because they are oxygen feeding bacteria. When we shake it a little bit, we can see we can see some chunks in there. There are geese that frequent, so that could be just about anything right there where the geese might have come by. Okay, so next we're going to test for the total dissolved oxygen. The amount of oxygen in water is important for different biological sources. They need oxygen to thrive and to live. So we're going to check how much oxygen is in each one. When you have a sample that doesn't have any oxygen in it, that's when nothing can live in it. So think of when a lake dies or when nothing can live in a creek because it's been polluted. A lack of oxygen indicates that there's a lot of pollution where ample amount of oxygen means a lot of things can live there or thrive there, or it might be better for your health. So we have our three different samples here. Our sample one was our water that came from Veterans Park that was out of a stream that was bubbling. We had our second sample. This was our filtered or our drinking water. And then we had our third sample that was the UK Gluck Pond. With all three of these, we can make a pretty good guess that there would be oxygen in them, which makes them good samples to test and we'll see the different color changes. 
With this first one, it came out of an area that was bubbling. The second one with drinking and filtered waters, we tend to add a little bit of oxygen, that way it's better for our health. And with ponds, we had geese living around here. So we had things living in these two. And this one here in the middle was something that we drank. First, we're going to start out with our clear empty sample bottle. And we're going to take a clean pipette just put a good amount of sample in there, that way we can really see what's going on. We're not doing too specific of a measure here, we're kind of just getting enough to see a reaction. So we have three pipettes full, let's see, that's, that's about 10 milliliters. We put our cap on and next we're going to pull out our mango sulfate solution. This solution is going to make what's called a flocculent precipitate. Flocculent means it looks like little flax. With that, it's part of an oxidation reaction. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have our starting solution in there. We won't see anything yet because we haven't added anything to it. Next, we're going to use our alkaline potassium iodide. This iodine is really important throughout this process because the iodine is going to react with quite a bit. We're going to get some really good colors with the iodine. When you think of iodine, think of like when you donate blood. Sometimes they clean your arm with it. On the top here you can see that kind of brownish color. That's the iodine reacting. It looks clear in the bottle because it's a compound, but you'll see here pretty quickly that it won't stay clear. Go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's that flocculent precipitate. So we have those kind of flex, that, that chunkiness in here. We'll just shake it up, get it nice and mixed. You can see this brownish color. That's the iodine that's gonna react with a lot of things. Next, we're going to add sulfuric acid. That's a really strong acid. It's going to work with the magnus hydroxide and it's gonna convert things in here. So we're gonna see a little bit of a change with our sulfuric acid. We're doing equal amounts of everything. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight drops in there. We can already see some things happening. And I'm just going to give this a swirl, it's going to turn it clear. This is also what we get we call an exothermic reaction. It's, it's making some heat. If you were here in person, you'd feel some heat with it. You get that a lot with those really strong acids. Next, we're going to use our sodium theosulfate. With this, it's going to react with the free iodine. So that's the iodine in here making this nice golden color. Now we're gonna just put a few drops in here to get it to turn to a pale yellow color. This is called a titration. A titration, we just do a little bit at a time. So we're getting a nice pale yellow now. Okay, we're gonna come back to this compound. Next, we add a starch indicator. The starch is going to give us a really cool color in here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight. Okay. We're going to mix that up and we have this deep dark purple. So the way we test how much dissolved oxygen is in here is how much sodium theosulfate it's going to take to change this into a nice light color. Now we won't get too hung up on values here. 
But in a web, you would want to look at where you started. We're at this zero right here. And we'd see how much it takes to get to a nice pale color. So we're just going to slowly add this in here. Go a little swish. Once we're at our total dissolved oxygen, we'll turn into really cool clear. So with this sample, it took the entire syringe to get this clear color. That tells us this bubbling stream is very high in oxygen, which is something we'd expect with a stream that fish live there. There are boulders with air going into the water as they as it trickles over the rocks. We would expect this one to be pretty high in oxygen. We'll go through the same process with the drinking water. We'll start with a clean syringe and do just a few squirts in here. We're not getting too caught up on measuring it. So we're looking for the reaction. We're at about 10, it's about three big squirts there. This is our filtered drinking water. With a lot of your filtered waters, they'll add oxygen. They might do it for flavor, they might do it for health benefits. We're just gonna do equal amounts of each of these again. We start with our magnus sulfate. We have one, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight. We'll give it a little swish. And we move on to our alkaline potassium iodine. So this is where we're gonna get all those cool yellow colors. We're just gonna take this cap off. These things are getting a little caught in there. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We see that cool reaction again. We it's that flocculent appearance. There's nice flex on there. We can already see that it's a little bit different of a color than the last one was. So we can see that our components are a little bit different. We have our strong acid. We're going to do the same amount in the strong acid. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now you can see that nice golden color appearing. Mix it up, let it get nice and clear. Now with this, we can already see this is a much paler yellow than our first one was. It's already paler, so it's not gonna take as much to get it the color that we want, which is great. Okay, we're just going to titrate a little bit in there to get that nice very yellow color. We don't want it to be clear. If we make it clear and we're impatient, then it's going to ruin the whole thing and we won't get accurate results. Put our starch indicator in to get a nice deep color. One, two, six, seven, eight. <clears throat> you can see that dark purple color on the top there. We'll shake it up, now it's nice and dark. And we'll go ahead and start titrating that and see what happens. So we're starting off with a full syringe again of our sodium thiosulfate. We're just gonna add this until it becomes colorless. Got a few drops in, we can already see some action happening there. Shake it up, and it's clear. So it hardly took any to make our drinking water clear. What that tells us is there was there was dissolved oxygen in there. There's enough in there for it to be life-sustaining. 
If you've ever set up a new fish tank, sometimes you put bottled water in there or something temporarily while you, while, while you let the water set up is because it has oxygen in it, but not nearly as much oxygen as a fresh bubbling stream with f fish living there. And we'll do our last sample here. Our last one came from the Gluck Pond. Now the Gluck Pond typically would be very high in oxygen, but they turned their aerator off right now, so it's not bubbling, this is stagnant water. We're getting to compare our first one here. Number one was a bubbling stream, number two was filtered bottled, and this third one is a stagnant water, which means it's not getting any movement really to it, but there are things living there, so we should see some good results in this. We'll start again with that magnesium sulfate. We're going to do eight drops of this. Got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we're going to add onto here our alkalized potassium iodine with azide. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. What's kind of neat here is we can see again, it's a different shade. We have that cool flocculent reaction, but this time we have more yellow in there. We have some different reactions happening, which tells us there's going to be a different amount of oxygen in here than there was in our last one. We'll add this sulfuric acid. This was our very strong acid. We're going to do eight drops in here, just like everything else. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's see. We can feel in here, it's a little bit warm too. So we have another exothermic, it's giving off energy as it's breaking apart those little pieces and making a nice, clear solution. Now we're going to titrate our sodium theosulfate to make that nice light yellow color. Got a nice pale golden yellow. Add our starch indicator in here. We'll do eight drops again. We're doing the same amount in everything. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Shake it up. We've got a dark purple. We just need to refill our syringe. We're going to start off with a full syringe just like we have with the other two so that we can really compare and contrast what we're seeing with this oxygen concentration. So we're starting out with a nice full syringe. We're going to titrate until we have some clear reaction. Okay, we're halfway through the syringe. We're seeing some changes there, and when we shake, the magic will happen. We can see halfway through the syringe here. So, we can gather from this, the data we get is that our bubbling stream or creek was very, very high in oxygen. This is an ideal place for things to live and thrive. So I actually live down the street from this stream, and this is somewhere that we see a lot of fish go through. There are a lot of bu bubbling boulders. There's a lot of air happening here. This is a great place for things to grow. Our second highest concentration was the stagnant pond. Despite being stagnant water where nothing's really moving, it still has quite a bit of oxygen. But where does it come from? Well, you might be able to see a little bit in this sample here in the bottom. There's a lot of algae in this water. Algae produces oxygen. We're getting a good amount of oxygen from this algae. And then our number two here, it had water, but not really an ideal amount for growth. The oxygen in this water was a healthy amount for you to drink, but it's filtered. It's been processed in a specific way. It's extremely clear in comparison to the other ones, and it had the lowest amount of oxygen. Next we'll check the water hardness. Water hardness is defined by the calcium carbonate in your water. You might find where you live you have hard water if you see a lot of your soap scum and your film around your bathroom. Sometimes hard water is kind of a chalky taste, 
because chalk is that calcium carbonate. So we have a few different compounds here we're going to add to our water and see some pretty interesting reactions on hardness. We have again our three different types of water. We have our first one that came from a bubbling stream locally here in Lexington, Kentucky. We have a filtered bottled water and we have a stagnant pond from the University of Kentucky Gluck Pond. We'll test each of these and see which ones are the hardest, which is the least hardest, and we'll kind of talk about what that means. So we'll start here with our stream water. First, we're going to fill our little sample bottle with a clean pipette to a little over 10 milliliters. So we're a little past 10, we're right at that 12.9 mark. That's perfect. Next, we're going to add five drops of this hardness agent. This is a variety of chemicals. It has some different types of sodium and potassiums to it that will react with the calcium carbonate. One, two, three, four, five. We'll give it a little swirl in there. So we're still nice and clear. Next, we're going to use a hardness tablet. And these tablets are going to turn it red. So we'll see some color change in here. This red color gives us an indicator. It has a binding magnesium, so it'll bind the calcium. And that indicator is going to give us a pretty cool coloration so that we can see the changes happening. We're just gonna swirl that around until it's all the way dissolved. So we have this, this purple kind of color. Now remember this whenever we look at it in comparison to the next ones. With the first one, it started off as kind of a magenta purple color. We're going to take our final hardness reagent. This is called EDTA. It's, what, it's what's called a chelator. A chelator means that it binds to other ions. This binding is going to tell us quite a bit. We'll take our syringe, and just like we did in our other reactions, we're going to pop our syringe in here. We're going to fill it up just like it was a shot. Now we're looking at the amount we start with. We're starting with a full syringe all the way up to zero. We're going to add a little bit at a time. We'll add a few drops, then we'll swirl, then a few drops, then we'll swirl. We're starting to see, see this, this magenta is turning more into a deeper violet. We're seeing some reactions happening there. We are going to do this until we have this really nice, gorgeous blue color. So this water, it has large stones in this creek. And these large stones are made of calcium. They have calcium in them. In Kentucky, we have quite a bit of calcium in our water from the limestone, so our water gets a pretty good reaction with things. Okay, now we have this nice clear blue color. We no longer have that magenta pink color. We can see from that, with our first water, it took about half of the syringe now there is a whole formula you can follow through this. If you're in my class, you have a packet that goes with it that talks about the math. But for the videos, we're really going over the concepts that it took about 100 milliliters to make this change. Okay, now we'll check our drinking water. We're going to compare the hardness of our drinking water to this creek or stream water. We'll take this and we're going to fill it up to that 12.9 spot again. Ok, 
Okay, we're right at our 12.9. We're going to start with our first hardness reagent. Do five drops. One, two, three, four, five. We have our hardness tablets. We'll put one of our tablets in there. Give this a nice swirl and let it dissolve. So with our bottled water, they add different minerals and components to bottled and filtered water. There's usually not as much calcium in it because if you consume too much calcium, you're susceptible to getting kidney stones. If any of you live in the southern states, you might know some people that have had kidney stones because the, the spring water is very rich in calcium, well water is very rich in calcium. So there's typically not a lot of calcium in our filtered water, but instead they add more of magnesium and potassium, so it still has that conductivity. Now remember with this first one, we had kind of a magenta color. Our bottled water, on the other hand, is already blue. So this doesn't have any hardness to it. It's extremely soft water. We don't even have to continue with any other compounds because we're already the end result color. This means that there's no calcium in that bottled water. Last, we're going to go through the Gluck Pond water. This is out of stagnant water. We'll fill it to the 12 and a half mark, just like we did with the others. Okay, we're right at that 12.9. We will add our first hardening agent. One, two, three, four, five. And then a hardness tablet. Now remember, with our first water that came out of the stream, when we put this tablet in, it turned into kind of a magenta pink color. With our bottled water, it was already our end color blue. With our pond water, we have kind of this magenta pink again. So this is telling us right off the bat, our pond water is hard. This is, this is very classic of all the water around here. We have pretty hard water. We're going to fill up our syringe with our hardening agent. We'll fill this up and do the same thing we did before. We're looking for that really nice bright blue color. This is just that hardening reagent again. This is EDTA, it's our chelator. Okay, we're just gonna slowly add a little bit and then swirl. We're already seeing a change in there. We're starting to get that blue violet really early on. Swirl. We're almost to our color, and we've hardly had to do anything. Swirl. We're already at our nice royal blue color. And we can look at our syringe here. This time, it only took about 60 drops to go into there. So there's a whole formula you can follow off of that. But the concept we're getting out of this is the hardness of the water. We found that our first water here that had boulders and large mineral stones was going over. This makes for really, really hard water because the water is going right over the boulders and it's getting infused with our calcium carbonate. The second water here, drinking water or filtered water, it had no calcium in it at all. All of the calcium carbonate was filtered out. Now this is, this is a pretty large molecule, so it's easy to filter out. And it's not something that you really want in your drinking water, or at least not in large quantities, because it could cause health problems. Then we have our third water here out of the Gluck Pond. This water was relatively hard, but not as hard as the first one. With our Gluck Pond, it's situated with stones in the bottom, so it's still getting that infusion of minerals, 
but not nearly as much as something that has water washing over the mineral and wearing it down. The last thing we'll cover in the labs today is our nitrate and our phosphate. Now out of our samples, all three of these actually test negative for nitrate and phosphates. We have our indicator here for nitrates with something that tests positive with nitrates. We would go through putting these two different chemicals into test tubes and then sliding it in here. We'd match up the color here on the side and this color would indicate how heavy it is in nitrates. Nitrates are an important thing to test for because they can be harmful to humans. They can cause problems with fetal hemoglobin and they can break down to even make you just sick to your stomach. This is something that can also promote an excessive amount of, al of algae growth. Our other side here is phosphates. We measure this in a very similar manner, except in this one it's blue. We would fill our tube up, we would add our chemicals to it, slide it in and match up the color on the side. With phosphates, these can be an important nutrient to different life-sustaining organisms. Thank you for watching our video today. I hope you learned a lot about the water that you drink and the water that's around you. If you have any questions or concerns, you can send me an email.